Hello and welcome to Indian Standard Time. I'm Siddharth Vardarajan and my guest today is the noted Pakistani public intellectual, scientist, academician, Parvez Hoodboy. Welcome to Raj Sabha TV. Thank you. Uh, Parvez, you are very well known in this country. You uh, teach at Qadi Azam University in Islamabad. You teach at Foreman Christian College. And you have been a commentator on and a keen observer of Pakistani uh, affairs, India-Pakistan relations, and of course, the entire question of uh, nuclear uh, uh, proliferation and disarmament at a, at a global level. Uh, it's a real pleasure to have you. Uh, uh, we caught you during a visit uh, to Delhi, and we hope to use the time that we have with you to discuss um, recent developments within Pakistan and, of course, uh, India-Pakistan relations. Well, I look forward to this discussion. I'm sure there's a lot that we can discuss in the few minutes that we have together. Absolutely. Now, w one of the issues that's been exercising uh, Pakistani civil society over the, over the past few days and uh, has been a subject for headlines within Pakistan as well as across the world, and I noticed there's uh, varying interpretations of this phenomenon on Pakistani electronic uh, media, TV channels, is the disappearance of uh, five liberal bloggers. Uh, we. Uh, have become accustomed to liberal bloggers being targeted in Bangladesh. Uh, free speech gets under attack uh, in, in, in our part of the world, including in India, uh, where powerful people take objection to something that somebody writes. But the manner in which these five have disappeared in Pakistan has energized the human rights community, civil society in Pakistan. What do we know about these disappearances and who might be behind them? One of course does not know for sure with 100% certainty, but the circumstances point to the involvement of the official agencies. The first reason that one is led to this suspicion is that it's very difficult to find the identities of those who are behind particular blogs or who run a certain Facebook page unless they are systematically um, targeted and unless those cyber tools are used to investigate the identities of those involved. Now, these persons, knowing how much danger was involved, presumably took a lot of precaution in doing that. Nevertheless, the fact that uh, in spite of multiple identities and moving from place to place, nevertheless, they were found out and um, then mysteriously di they disappeared. And what's more all pretty much at the same time? <clears throat> that, that it happened simultaneously yes. or more or less simultaneously with five different bloggers and now we hear that there are maybe one or two others who are also missing, not from Punjab but from Sindh. That points to, I think, um, not just some individual group which, is, which has been outraged by what the content of these blogs and Facebook pages, but rather that it was the... Um, official agencies which were somehow involved at this stage. For the benefit of our viewers, the contents of these pages and you know blogs and Facebook pages were essentially liberal, anti-establishment, anti-military. Uh, tell us something about the content that uh, used to be put out through these uh, pages. Okay, I would put them into two separate categories. There was a website, the, not a website, but a Facebook page called Bhesa, uh, male cow, right. uh, buffalo. And there was another, there were two, one was called Mochi and the other one was called Roshni. Now, Bhansa had content which uh, some say is blasphemous, that directly targeted Islam itself, the Prophet. In their defense, it is being said that this was an open website and that anybody uh, could post anything over right. there and therefore that this was not the policy of right. those who ran that Facebook right. page. The other ones were specifically directed against the military. They called for peace with uh, Pakistan's neighbors, including India. They were uh, against corruption and so forth, but anti-establishment. What is happening presently is that an attempt is being made to conflate the two together. and. And in this fact, attempt is being done by sections of the electronic media? Or, no, or, actually or, you know, the religious parties okay, in so Pakistan, the Jamaat-e-Islami in fact, has a demonstration just yesterday uh, which called for the strictest punishments to be inflicted upon those who had insulted Islam and there was no attempt made to differentiate between these three different websites. 
So it's obviously outraged uh, the state, but it's, it's inflamed the extreme right-wing opinion in Pakistan. Uh, 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 Parvis, give us a sense of the kind of mobilization that, that is happening now. Uh, of course, religious parties are, have gone into the fray and in a way condoning the disappearances of these people. But what's the reaction of the civil society been? Civil society, ha well, this, let me first tell you about the uncivil part of civil society. Right. So at the Islamabad Press Club, when there was uh, an attempt to take out a demonstration, the Jamaat-e-Islami activists came and they actually threw stones at those who were protesting at the disappearances of the bloggers. So that's, uh, I, I am sad to say, that is a part of Pakistani society. Mm. On the other hand, if one looks at the newspapers, one sees an outpouring of sympathy and even those who are, who are not sympathetic with the content of the websites are saying that this is no way to deal with citizens of Pakistan, those who have not actually caused it harm, that on the one hand, and the fact that, uh, look, there are extreme jihadi websites which uh, openly advocate violence, violence against other sects, violence against other religions, violence against even the government itself. Why are they not being banned? Why are their websites intact, not hacked, like uh, the ones I mentioned they have been now hacked into and all kinds of content is posted onto them. So this tolerance of uh, right-wing religious views by the government, by the state, is something that uh, civil society, or at least a good part of civil society does not like in Pakistan. Mm. The Pakistani courts earlier when Musharraf was president uh, were very active and in a way got exercised at least partially on the question of disappearances from Balochistan. Uh, what's the role of the courts and the judiciary been in the case of these bloggers? Has there been any attempt by the judiciary to push the government to act uh, and to find these uh, five? Or to produce them in court? Or, in the or case, to release them? In the case of one blogger, I can say with certainty that an FIR was filed. I guess you have FIRs Absolutely. in India Absolutely. too? Okay, yeah. so we have the yeah. same system there in Pakistan. And the, and the filing of an FIR can be as unpredictable a process as it, as it may be in Pakistan too. Yeah, and uh, oftentimes the police the doesn't refuse. accept an yeah. FIR. So I know for sure that one family filed an FIR and um, that this is for for the uh, for the first one who was arrested, Salman, but the others, um, so one of them subsequently also uh, did file an FIR in Lahore, but uh, the three others have been reluctant. The families of the three have been reluctant because they feel that this will bring more opprobrium up upon themselves. So there is a fear of even trying to file a formal police complaint. Um, we, so the f courts at this moment have not been activated. But interestingly today, the Interior Minister, Chaudhary Nisar, said that uh, he was outraged at the disappearances and at the fact that um, there was, uh, an that Jamaat-e-Islami activists were stoning the protesters, those who were protesting against the disappearances. I believe even in Karachi, they, were, they attacked some of the protesters as well. Yes, yeah. yes. Th that is true as well at the Karachi Press Club. The, one of the extreme right-wing parties did attack the protesters there. Right. So you feel that the government may uh, actually be goaded into, into taking action in this case? Well, it's hard to say. Right. Um, the government should be, in fact, uh, outraged at the fact that the citizens of Pakistan, those who have done no harm to the state, those who have not engaged in terrorist activities, are being muzzled in this way. This is a clear violation of their civil rights, and it is an indication that the government is not in control. So it is going directly against the writ of the state. Right. And for this reason, I believe that uh, this requires the attention of the Prime Minister and not just the Interior Minister. Uh, Parvez, as a writer and as a commentator, you know, as somebody who's never flinched from writing pretty sharp 
comments on the state of affairs in your country. Do you feel constrained based on what's happened over the last couple of weeks uh, in terms of what you could write, what you think is safe to write? Are other writers uh, uh, trimming their sails to make sure that they don't fall foul of uh, uh, those who are behind this kind of uh, forced disappearance? I have reason to believe that a lot of people have felt pressure. Uh, they, one, of, one person wrote to me saying that he had started thinking seriously of starting a blog and uh, that he was well on the way until this incident happened. Right. And others have written uh, f expressing their dismay and their fear. So yes, I do believe that this will have a dampening effect upon the expression of free thought in Pakistani society. In terms of uh, what it will do to me, I don't think it will do very much because they know me, I speak what I think is correct, I support my, my arguments with facts, I do not use harsh words because I think that is counterproductive and I shall keep doing exactly what I have done for a very long time. No, you've been a brave and courageous voice and uh, I'm pretty sure that that's the way you'll carry on. There's no question about that. But you've also been a very astute observer of uh, Pakistani affairs and Pakistani national politics. One of the uh, developments over the past couple of months was the uh, manner in which the former army chief, uh, everybody was expecting, you know, General Rahil Sharif, there was a whole hysteria being built up that he should get an extension and that he is the most popular army chief Pakistan's ever had. And of course, he, he retired peacefully and was replaced by somebody that Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif picked. Does this represent a new phase in civil military relations in Pakistan? Or do you think given the kind of international scrutiny of what is happening in Pakistan and the role Pakistan is playing in, in, uh, uh, in the American scheme of things that uh, it, is, it was inevitable that this kind of handover or changeover would take place? For whatever reason it happened, it was very welcome. He did not, at least publicly, ask for an extension. And so when his term was up, General Rahil Sharif left. What he's gone into, we can come back to later. Nawaz Sharif got to pick the man that he thought would be most appropriate for leading the Pakistan army. There was opposition to that. There was an attempt to defame him. But I think that Nawaz Sharif has chosen somebody who he feels will bring a measure of stability to relations between Pakistan and India and uh, who does not wish to use a personal image to carry out policies of the army. So in that sense I think it's a very welcome development but uh, I take um, a little exception to your other comment which is that the Americans may have wanted it to be so. I don't think the Americans exercise very much influence in Pakistan now. Okay. They did once upon a time. But today America has become less and less relevant to Pakistan and I think we are now looking away from the United States and towards China. Right. Right. No, I mean not in terms of America dictating but given the uh, role that Pakistan plays in the so-called coalition, etc. But anyway, that's just, that's, we'll set that aside. The point is well taken that you've made. Uh, you touched upon an interesting facet of what may have driven Nawaz Sharif, which is to uh, pick an army chief who perhaps favors uh, a certain measure of stability in India-Pakistan relations. There's been a perception here in India that uh, Nawaz Sharif and the army and the early army and General Rahi Sharif were not always on the same page, that even if Nawaz Sharif favoured uh, better relations with India and wanted to move ahead, the army was somehow holding him back. How true or correct uh, was that, is that perception? Uh, or, or is it something that uh, is part of the misreading of uh, Pakistan's dynamics that, um, you know, uh, may have happened? I think there's a certain amount of evidence that uh, seems to confirm that point of view that of a difference between the civil and the military leadership of Pakistan and this became evident at the time of the dawn leak where a journalist by the name of Cyril Almeida was uh, made privy to a discussion between the 
the, the civilian leadership of Pakistan, including Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif and his brother Shabazz. Shahbaz Sharif, on the one hand, and between the ISI chief and the military hierarchy on the other. And uh, <clears throat> the issue came, one of the issues that came about was that Pakistan's diplomacy on Kashmir is not doing very well internationally. And so what are our foreign diplomats doing? What are Pakistani diplomats doing in their work in the UN, in the capitals in various countries? And here, um, Shahbaz Sharif and Nawaz Sharif are supposed to have said that they're not doing very well because uh, whenever they broach the issue of Kashmir, the other response from the other side is, hey, what are you doing in India? And that, he said, is not good for Pakistan's diplomatic position. And in, during this conversation, he laid the onus upon what the ISI was doing in the matter of terrorism, both uh, across and within Pakistan borders. So it, this was leaked to the press, right. and then uh, it, was, it became a matter of uh, great concern to the army. The government formally denied it. Cyril Almeida was briefly placed on the exit control list. And this, I think, is an indication of the rift, which is not a new one, between the civil and military parts of Pakistan's establishment. And I think the appointment of the new army chief is going in a direction so as to heal that. Right. And, and yet, Parvez, when, when we listen to some statements made by Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif or his diplomatic advisor, Sartaj Aziz, uh, even if these statements have been made during a very troubling or difficult time uh, between India and Pakistan. But many of these statements uh, seem much more hardline than they might have been, say, a year and a half or two years ago. To your mind, has, has there been some change in Nawaz Sharif's own approach uh, towards India, that earlier he was seen in this country as a, a pragmatist who was willing to go the extra mile to have better relations with India? Today he seems, in terms of you know, the issues he raises or talking of going back to uh, the UN resolution on Kashmir, various other things, falling back to positions that Pakistan hadn't talked about for about 10 years. Has there been a shift in Nawaz Sharif's own, own position vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the relationship with India? If my personal opinion is that there has not been, an, not been a shift, but that his rhetoric has become harder, and that's okay. because the rhetoric from the Indian side has okay. become much harder. Right. The threat to uh, overturn the Indus Waters Treaty, the threat, the open threat that uh, Balochistan is now ripe for secession from Pakistan, all those would draw a reaction from any government in Pakistan. Mm. And so I, while I'm, I must say, I am not a fan of the Nawaz Sharif government for many reasons. Nevertheless, mm. I will give them credit mm. for extending the olive branch to India and for carrying out a number of liberal reforms within Pakistan. Mm. And I would think that uh, it would be very unfortunate if there was a change of leadership um, um, because of the cases that are now in, in court. Elections are still a couple of years away. Next uh, year. Next year. Yeah. Uh, uh, 20, uh, 2018, that's right. Um, how do you assess the balance of forces? I know it's uh, politics can be as unpredictable in Pakistan as it is in India. But uh, there was a time when Imran Khan was seen as uh, unquestioningly, uh, uh, unquestionably the most ascendant political player. Uh, today, uh, how would you assess the balance of forces between the three main political parties nationally? The People's Party today stands discredited because of the corruption and the misgovernance that uh, it, the lost opportunities over the period of, of its time in power. Right. And, and that's still fresh in people's minds. That is fresh in people's mind. Moreover, it still has the government in Sindh, where um, the greatest amount of misgovernance is happening. It is no longer appealing to liberals because it seems to have lost its manifesto. All it seems to be is about preserving the power of the Bhutto family. And that is not attractive to anyone. Right. 
So they might have a cult following in Sindh, but not beyond that. Okay. Next comes Imran Khan, who a lot of people had a lot of faith in that here was a Pakistan, he, he was a person out to build a new Pakistan. He promised a corruption-free government in 90 days. He, he uh, said he would uh, make Pakistan a rising star, etc., etc. But when you look at his agenda, it doesn't seem to go beyond saying that make me the prime minister of Pakistan and, and I'll believe. do it all. Right. Unfortunately, people cannot forget his, uh, his closeness to the Taliban. He was, after all, nominated as their representative in the talks between the Tehrike Taliban Pakistan and the Pakistani government. They cannot forget the, the numerous excuses that he gave for their atrocities. They cannot forget that uh, he even suggested that the TTP, which is now the sworn enemy of the Pakistani state and which the Pakistani state is now targeting, he, he had suggested that they form offices in Pakistan. His single item agenda is make me the prime minister. And it doesn't seem to go beyond that. So a lot of young people who were with him have now lost faith. That leaves only Nawaz Sharif. And Nawaz Sharif, people are quite impressed by the liberal streak that uh, he has shown from time to time. And yes, his rhetoric at times doesn't seem to be that good, but then given the circumstances, I don't think any other prime minister could do better. The last election, Pervez, in 2013 was fought uh, largely on domestic issues to the extent to which India was a factor at all. Uh, it was a factor where, uh, in, in, uh, with virtually every party saying that if elected, they would improve relations, they would work to improve relations with India. Is it your sense, given the kind of deterioration that we've seen in the bilateral relationship over the last couple of years, that by the time elections come around next year, if things don't improve with Delhi, uh, India will figure in a different manner? Uh, uh, might, might we see politicians competing uh, seeking votes on the basis of promising to take a so-called tougher line with India? Certainly, if uh, it's between Imran Khan and Nawaz Sharif, Imran Khan is going to be saying, oh, look, Nawaz Sharif had taken such a soft line. He went for India. the inaugural. He went for yeah, the in right. Modi's inaugural. Right. He, he, uh, he unke samne late gaya. Hmm. He'll be saying those things. Hmm. But, और एक तरह से वही इल्जाम यहाँ पे मोदी साहब पे लोग लगाते हैं कि वो लाहौर कैसे और क्यों गए लेकिन मगर उससे फर्क नहीं पड़ेगा राइट राइट सो आई आई थिंक इफ देर इज अ कंपटीशन बिटवीन द तहरीक इन साफ इमरान खान पार्टी एंड द पीएमएलएन नवाज शरीफ पार्टी देर इज नो कंपटीशन रियली नवाज शरीफ विल सर्टेनली विन ऑन दिस अकाउंट बट एंड मे गेट अ फोर्थ चांस uh, you know, we, we spoke a bit earlier about the rhetoric um, in Pakistan, in India, um, the harsher rhetoric that we've heard over the past year. Analysts in India would say that uh, a lot of the tough talk that we've heard coming from Indian leaders on the Indus, on terror, uh, is aimed at sending an unambiguous message to the Pakistani side that, look, India, there's a limit to how much cross-border terror India can put up with and that enough's enough and uh, they would perhaps say that the fact that uh, and you know this is the only way to uh, in a way goad Pakistan into getting serious about acting on on terror. Uh, your sense is that this may be counterproductive. Uh, it's led to uh, harsh rhetoric from the Pakistani side and in a way you have an escalatory ladder of, of, of rhetoric. Uh, nevertheless, um, is there uh, some sense in which the language that is being used on the Indian side is also having a positive impact in Pakistan in terms of um, incentivizing or pushing the elements of the Pakistani establishment to, to be more serious? Well, look, it has to be very nuanced because on the one hand, India wants cross-border terrorism to go away. So do we because that is intimately linked with domestic terrorism. Both of them have to go away. And in that sense, I think that, uh, let's say, responding to an attack in Uri or Pathan Court or whatever might come in the future, 
it, uh, that, that response should not be a military response because we know what the dangers of such a response would be given that now both sides have nuclear weapons, Pakistan now has tactical nuclear weapons as well and uh, the escalation could happen without even anyone wanting it to happen or it, anyone sensible, anyone in command wanting it to happen. It could be driven by the extremist agenda. So uh, we all want extremism to go away. However, there are limits that should not be crossed in terms of rhetoric because what it can end up with is mobilizing entire blocks of population on this side and on that side, which then fan the flames of war. And once conventional war starts, right. there's little chance that it'll remain confined. Right. Or ra I should say, there are large chances that it will not remain confined. Right. My final question, Pervez, uh, the Indian government's view is that talks and terror cannot go hand in hand and that until terrorism stops or Pakistan shows a commitment to act against terror, there can be no question of resuming dialogue. As, uh, as, a, as an observer of India-Pak relations, as a critic of a lot that uh, is happening on the Pakistani side, how would you assess this position of the Indians? What advice would you give to the government of India and to India in general about the uh, need to engage or not? I would advise the government of India to l be more nuanced in its approach, to recognize the fact that there are currents in Pakistan that are now seeking a new national narrative. Earlier on, it was focused uh, largely upon Kashmir, on, on, uh, on issues that were not related to the well-being of Pakistan, but rather outwardly directed. There is now a growing recognition within Pakistan that this is something that is not flying. It's hurting the country a lot. And so just last week, there was a meeting called by the National Counterterrorism Authority, NACTA, in which scholars, academics, policemen, police officers, and army people were invited to sit together around tables and to see where Pakistan should be going. And without an exception, they all said that the way that we've been going is wrong. What we need is a policy that builds upon Pakistan, looks to its well-being, has peace with its neighbors, and that we cannot deal with any form of terrorism. So we should not make a distinction between good terrorists or bad terrorists. All terrorism is bad. So the government of India needs to recognize that. Rather than encourage the hardliners, it should now recognize the fact that there are different currents and a current that is going in a way which will lead towards peace between India and Pakistan unless it is uh, derailed. And that derailment must not be allowed to happen by people of goodwill on both sides. Right. On that note, Parvez Hulboy, we'll have to end it there. Thank you very much for joining us on Indian Standard Time. Thank you. Well, that wraps up this episode. Do join me again next week with another guest. Thank you for watching.